So today I just wanted to uh, kind of go through Isaiah 53, verse by verse, and just kind of uh, talk about each, each verse. So if Vadik can uh, put the words up for Isaiah 53. Um, I want to start first by uh, reading a quote from Adam Clark about the chapter. Um, he says, This chapter foretells the suffering of the Messiah, the end for which he was to die, and the advantages resulting to mankind from that illustrious event. This chapter contains a beautiful summary of the most peculiar and distinguishing doctrines of Christianity. Um, so, uh, starting with verse 1. Um, who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? So, it must be hard to believe the message. It seems contradictory that the suffering of Jesus um, will at the same time bring salvation and cleansing to the world. So, Isaiah anticipated that the message will be rejected. How is God's powerful arm revealed in the context of the suffering Messiah? So, the picture of the Lord's arm is his strength, his power, his might. Yet we see Messiah weak and in agony. Um, so through this, many may not receive uh, the rev revelation of God's arm. And we see it nowadays, um, people saying things like, if God is so strong, why are there people dying or suffering from diseases? Um, these kind of statements are around everywhere. Um, but the strength and the power and the might of God will be expressed in the midst of this suffering, in the midst of this seemingly weak Messiah. Um, in verse 2, I want to split it up into uh, twos. So the first part is, um, my servant grew up in the Lord's presence like a tender green shoot, like a root in a dry ground. So um, Jesus grew up just like he grew up, just like we grew up. And um, as he grew, he gained wisdom, uh, stature, and favor with God and men, as it says in Luke 2.52. Um, but all the while, he was a tender plant, as it says in the verse, uh, and not a mighty tree a plant of seeming weakness and insignificance. Um, a tender plant is weak and vulnerable. That is, unless, of course, it's in the presence or before the presence of God. So God's presence makes things that seem weak strong. Um, and then God can also bring the most wonderful things out of dry ground. So the verse says, like a root in dry ground. Um, God's presence can sustain life even on dry ground. And where Jesus was growing up, which was the Galilee region of the Roman-occupied Palestine, it was uh, dry in the sense of spiritual and political and living standards. Um, so we shouldn't think of dry places as useless. Um, instead, think of uh, these dry places as dark. So in the midst of light, life can even grow in all of the driest places. Um, and then the um, second half of the verse is, there was nothing beautiful or majestic about his presence, nothing to attract us to him. So when we try to attract people to Jesus through beauty or form, we go against the nature of who Jesus was. There's a quote from uh, Alan Redpath that I want to read that I really like. Um, These days it appears we have to dress the gospel up to make it attractive. We have to use the methods of technique which must be smart, well presented, and streamlined. There must be something that appeals to people. I wonder if we stop to think that in our efforts to make the gospel message attractive, we are drawing a curtain across the face of Jesus in his humiliation. The only one that can make him attractive is the Holy Spirit. I thought, I thought that was really powerful. Um, and then um, verse 3, um, he was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted with deepest grief. We turned our backs on him. We looked the other way. He was despised, and we did not care. Um, so, of course, Jesus showed happiness and joy. Um, but he knew grief and sorrow so intimately that he was called, he was nicknamed the man of sorrows. So when we feel sorrow, it's usually uh, self-pity or the feeling of, of feeling sorry for ourselves. Um, but Jesus' sorrow was never for himself. It was for others, for the fallen, desperate condition of humanity. Um, all of the suffering of the body and the soul were known to him. If we just think about that for a second, think about what uh, it would be like to take the sorrows of your neighbor or family member or friend in the deepest way possible where you are actually deeply experiencing what they are. I mean, it seems impossible to me. Um, uh, it seems unfathomable, unfathomable unless I myself have been there um, in, due to shortcomings. So being, the nicknamed, uh, being nicknamed the man of sorrows doesn't look good for you in terms of acceptance either. I mean, who wants to follow a man named, nicknamed man of sorrows? 
Um, so this was one of the other many reasons Jesus was rejected, or in Isaiah's time, he predicts will be uh, rejected. So we men f value physical beauty and charisma more than God does, and we reject what God accepts. Um, verse 4 says, Yet it was our weakness he carried, it was our sorrows that weighed him down, and we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. So our, Isaiah reveals to us what I said earlier, that Jesus took our pain upon himself, he made our griefs his own, and our sorrows as if they were his. Uh, we know this, but we also have to release our grief and sorrow in order for it to do any good for us. Uh, verse 5 says, But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. Um, we know the Messiah was stricken, bruised, afflicted, and now Isaiah reveals to us why. So for it was for our tra transgressions and iniquities. Isaiah's vision for healing was found in suffering of Jesus. Um, and this healing was the physical sense, which, was, which is uh, shown in Matthew 8, 16 through 17. I'm not going to read that. And then uh, the spiritual sense as well, which um, in Peter, um, there's evidence of that as well. Um, verse 6, all of us as sheep have strayed away. We have left God's path to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. Um, so we need Messiah's work because our ways lead to sinful destruction in destructive ways. Sheep are headstrong and pretty dumb without the shepherd. So, uh, yeah, we definitely need Jesus in our lives. And verse 7, he was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep is silent before its shears, he did not open his mouth. So I'm just going to read uh, Mark uh, 15, 2 to 5. This is uh, uh, Jesus' trial before Pilate. Um, and um, Pilate asked Jesus, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus replies, You have said it. And then the leading priest kept accusing him of many crimes, and Pilate asked him, Aren't you going to answer them? What about all these charges they are bringing against you? But Jesus said nothing, much to Pilate's surprise. So Isaiah predicted it, you know, long before it actually happened that... Um, Jesus wouldn't open his mouth. He only spoke, the only time he spoke was to glorify God. And Jesus wasn't a lamb in the sense he was hopeless. He was uh, showing that, Isaiah was showing that he was silent. Um, verse 8, unjustly condemned, he was led away. No one cared that he died without descendants, that his life was cut short in midstream. He was struck down for the rebellion of my people. So Isaiah drives the point again that the servant of the Lord, who is Jesus, suffers and suffers, not for himself, but for the transgressions of others. Um, verse 9, he had not done no wrong and he had never deceived anyone, but he was buried like a criminal. He was put in a rich man's grave. So the Messiah never sinned. Even in his death, he remained the Holy One in the midst of his pain and suffering. Uh, verse 10, but it was the Lord's good plan to crush him and cause him grief. Yet when his life is made an offering for sin, he will have many descendants. He will enjoy a long life and the Lord's good plan will prosper in his hands. So it was all part of uh, the plan to bring God's victory, actually please God. Jesus was not a victim of any political or military um, power. He was performing the most holy service that the Father ever offered. That pleased God. Accomplishing the work of reconciling the world to himself was completely pleasing to God. And his death, burial, and offering, of, and the death, uh, burial, and offering of Jesus doesn't end, in, end the story. You know, he lives on today. Um, Verse 11, when, we, when he sees all that is accomplished by his anguish, he will be satisfied. And because of his experience, my righteous servant will make it possible for many to be counted righteous, for he will bear all their sins. Uh, Jesus will have no regrets because of the result. It is, knowing, it is in knowing the Messiah in both who he is and what he has done that makes us justified before God. And then uh, the last verse, I give him the honors of a victorious soldier because he exposed himself to death. He was counted among the rebels. He bore the sins of many and interceded uh, for rebels. So Paul says it perfectly in Philippians 2, um, 10 through 11. So I'll just read that as well.
Um, he says, and that at the name of at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. I mean, just imagine that victory. You know, when the entire world is proclaiming Jesus' name, like. Um, at, at FCA, we run a, uh, I run like an FCA group with athletes at UB, and um, I, talk, I talked about how awesome it would be if like an entire locker room was uh, for Jesus or like together in Jesus, um, and what good things can come from that. And I can only imagine the entire world, um, which is pretty uh, unfathomable to me. Um, so what a glorious reward. The suffering and humiliation only bring more glory and majesty to Jesus. And Jesus splits the spoils of victor uh, with us as well, as it says in Romans 8, 17. Uh, we, share, we share that glory with Christ. Imagine a, imagine a godly woman looking at a list of prostitutes and saying, uh, put my name on that list with them. Or a godly man doing, uh, looking at a list of murderers and saying that, saying that same thing. And that's what Jesus did for us at a greater extent. Um, and Isaiah prophesied this, and it was done. Amen. Дорогие братья и сестры, давайте мы поднимемся на наши ноги. Поднимемся на наши ноги, друзья. Действительно, то, что говорил Дима, особенно в последнее время, именно о том, чтобы мы несли это Евангелие, чтобы мы были этими свидетелями, друзья, знаете, и он напомнил вот эту организацию. И когда мы имели там буквально, может, два месяца назад пасторская конференция была, знаете, и просто в беседе с этими простыми людьми, которые живут в нашем городе, американцы, и когда они просто называли имена вот наших братьев, которые сегодня здесь, и действительно хороший отзыв именно о том, насколько важно воспитывать, особенно сегодня в такой день, знаете, воспитывать наших детей, чтобы они возрастали. Вот в этой Господней благодати, друзья, чтобы они чувствовали, могли выходить, нести это Евангелие, не только здесь выйти проповедовать впервые, друзья, но идти в эту жизнь и вот быть этим живым свидетелем, неся вот это Евангелие Иисуса Христа, которое мы продолжаем сегодня. И мне хотелось бы, друзья, просто помолиться, открыть наши сердца, поблагодарить Бога, благословить этих молодых братьев на их английском языке, чтобы они действительно знаете, возрастали, смотрели на нас, а мы отдали все то, что имеем в наших сердцах для них, и они взяли это благословение и понесли дальше для погибающего этого мира, друзья. И это очень важно, когда мы благословляем, молимся и сопровождаем, а они понесут это имя Иисуса Христа, которое сегодня в наших сердцах, в нашем разуме. Откроем наши сердца и поблагодарим Бога, и благословим нашу молодежь. Аллилуйя! Будем молиться, Отец Небесный! Господи, мы Твои дети,